um, the largest state-run awards program in the country, and letters about literature. Um, please join our mailing list, um, take part in our reading challenge, um, or locate and attend any of our special events, uh, such as the panel discussion we're sponsoring here today. Um, so it's my pleasure to turn over the program, Dismantling Institutional Oppressions, to our moderator, Grace Tulusian. Grace is the author of The Body Papers, winner of the Restless Books Prize for New Immigrant Writing, and the 2020 Massachusetts Book Award in Nonfiction. Her writing has been supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Fulbright, United States Artists, Brother Thomas Fund, and Massachusetts Cultural Council. She teaches in the nonfiction writing program at Brown University, and the center is grateful for her participation today. Grace? Thank you. Thank you. I'm really honored to be part of this important conversation. Um, as an immigrant schoolgirl, I learned about what it meant to be an American, and I learned a particular narrative. And what these three authors are doing today is um, challenging that narrative and telling the truth about um, our, our country and our system. Um, and I think what's really important is the way that they're looking at institutional and systemic forces such as educational, judicial, and governmental policies and how that's shaped our lives and our ideas about race. Um, and so we'll hear from each of the authors today and then I'll start out by asking a couple questions and then you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions as well. Um, so we'll start to, with um, historian Donald Yakovone, who's a lifetime associate at Harvard University's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. Um, his book, um, sorry, um, sorry, his book Teaching White Supremacy takes a hard look at the role of white supremacy in teaching history in America and has, re has been reviewed as a quote, profoundly original cultural history. It was also a finalist in the LA Times Book Award for History. Is this one? Okay. Uh, the cover of Teaching White Supremacy is based on an 1873 uh, lithograph variously titled American Progress or America Manifest Destiny. Uh, you probably can't see this. Uh, anyway, that's the cover. Uh, the uh, original oil painting is actually in the Gene Autry Museum in uh, Southern California. It exalts the divine mission of the United States to inevitably expand across the continent. The illustration's alluring figure of Columbia with the Star of Empire on her forehead floats across the landscape, sweeping away indigenous peoples in the wilderness with the expansion of American farms, cities, and railroads. Her left hand clutches the telegraph line and the internet of the 19th century, and her right hand clutches not the Bible, not a digest of laws, but as even Crawford wrote, the emblem of education, the school book. It actually says school book right on it. I didn't realize that until I could focus in on the image, scanned it, and found that. Uh, never before or since has any American more graphically unified national identity with white supremacy and education. It illustrates a cherished past that is now becoming unhinged. I did not set out to write this book. I had been deep into research for a different book, an entirely different book, when I encountered this astonishing collection of about 3,000 history textbooks at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Monroe C. Gutman Library. This astonishing force, or the astonishing force of that collection, forced me, compelled me, to drop my original project and throw myself into the unknown. I had no idea where this was going. The result, not a book about a bunch of bad books, but rather an exploration of the origins, development, and perpetuation of the idea of American national identity as white. 
from the colonial era to today. If nothing else, it focuses on the responsibility of Northern cultural leaders and educators for the creation and dissemination of white supremacy and the construction of what used to be called the color line. Traditionally, both scholarship and popular thought have blamed the legacy of Southern slavery for the distressing persistence of racial inequality. And of course, Southern slave owners and their descendants do possess a, a unique and lethal responsibility for racial oppression and civil war. But even if slaves had never existed in the South, Northern white religious leaders, intellectuals, writers, politicians, scientists, educators, and lawyers would have invented a lesser race, which is exactly what happened, to build white democratic solidarity and in that way make democratic culture and political institutions possible. As the novelist Toni Morrison once explained, in the United States, the rights of man was, and these are her words, inevitably yoked to Africanism. In other words, American democracy depended upon black inequality to sustain white equality. Responsibility for this enduring identity of true Americans as only descendants of white Europeans rests broadly and profoundly in our history. The principles of white supremacy have been central to the American experience, predating the creation of the American Republic and whatever commitment to democratic republicanism that later emerged. So for example, Samuel Sewell, the legendary 17th century judge of the Salem witchcraft trials, expressed the essence of how later white Americans would come to understand national identity. The people of African descent who lived and moved among them, uh, not even considering the Native American residents, uh, especially in New England, would always be outsiders, foreign objects, no matter how respected, even admired, some people of African descent might have been, as Sewell noted in his own famous diary, they would have remained separate, distinct, and outside the mainstreams of American life. In many ways, Sewell is reflective of this history uh, of uh, what we call race. Sewell, who in 1700 crafted the selling of Joseph, the first anti-slavery pamphlet in American history, had denounced slavery as an unchristian scourge and reminded New Englanders that he, quote, hath made of one blood all nations of men. Despite the fact, Sewell also explained that African Americans, and these are his words, still remain in our body politic as a kind of extravasant blood. They existed outside the regular veins and capillaries of the body politic. The African presence raised such fearsome concerns for Sewell, Sewell the abolitionist, that it made him wonder if he would retain his cherished whiteness, and again, these are his words, quote, after the resurrection. This assertion of a people who exist outside of American identity, beyond white consciousness, set the pattern that would be with us to this day. James Baldwin, a celebrated African-American author and critic, recalled in 1965 that, and these are his words, I was taught in American history books that Africa had no history, and neither had I. I was a savage about whom the least said the better who had been saved by Europe and who had been brought to, to America. And trust me, my analysis of uh, hundreds of textbooks confirms everything he said. This was, his educate, education taught him, an act of God. You belong where white people put you. And it always came so. himself. In the 1920s, if an African-American student had asked the teacher why no black people appeared in their history textbook, the answer would have been that African-Americans had, quote, done nothing to merit inclusion. As the black scholar Charles H. Wesley reported in 1925, through textbooks and classroom instruction, the black student quickly realized, quote, that his badge of color in America is a sign of subjugation, inferiority, and contempt. 
In 1939, the NAACP surveyed popular American history textbooks, and as one black student concluded from the association's findings, since textbooks drill white supremacy in the minds of growing children, I see how hate and disgust is motivated against the American Negro. Textbooks are intended to express the nation's most treasured legacy, what the country values in the past and its hopes for the future. They are a kind of prayer book for the national civil religion that both reflect cultural values and help form them. They serve as engines of democracy and equality to forge national identity and unity. But what, has, but what was the nature of that unity textbooks came to create? The overwhelming majority stretched me back to the 19th century. I began it. In 1832, looking at these, began with the assumption that the history of the United States was the history of the white man, his struggles against Native Americans, almost always referred to as red savages, and their intolerable efforts to destroy the superior race, quote unquote, and white need to control the lives of African Americans. As the 1918 textbook explained to students, Whatever non-English people had done to help create the United States, quote, and these are all in italics, the forces that have shaped that life have been English. Long before Emerson had worshipped that view in his 1856 book, English Traits. Most textbooks variously presented African Americans as foreign, as a foreign repellent element, an unwanted presence, a, a necessary evil or a threat in all ways, as one 1914 textbook asserted, quote, a problem that it took many years to solve. Thomas Maitland Marshall's 1930 textbook embodied the ideals, assumptions, and aims of most American history textbooks published before 1970. And on the very first page of his book, in capital letters, the top, it said, the story of the white man. As so many other 20th century textbooks inculcated, Marshall taught that, quote, the Negro of plantation days was usually happy. He was fond of the company of others and liked to sing, dance, crack jokes, and laugh. He admired bright colors and was proud to wear a red or orange bandana. Oh, he was never in a hurry and always ready to let things go until tomorrow. Most planners, he asserted, learned that loyalty based on pride, kindness, and rewards, not the whip, brought the best returns. And the book is filled with this stuff. A lot of them, a lot worse than what you just heard. American children learned that reconstruction, in reconstruction, Quote, Negroes were unfit to rule. It had been a terrible mistake, 20th century. 20th century textbooks proclaimed to, quote, prevent the intelligent white people from governing after the Civil War. Authors assured readers that, quote, men of intelligence and property will not submit to the rule of the ignorant, and of course by ignorant they meant African Americans, very long. As professional Professor Marshall had concluded, quote, white robes and fiery crosses had the desired results. While the very worst features of our textbooks have been eliminated, the problem that James Baldwin identified back in the 1960s remains, and distressingly so. The influential New York Times journalist, Charles Blow, expressed, uh, explained rather, that when he was young, he was born in 1970, which for me is just yesterday, I was led to believe that blackness was inferior. We had been trained in it, bathed in it, acculturated to hate ourselves. At every turn, at every moment, I was being baptized in the narrative that everything white was right, good, noble, and beautiful, and everything black was not. The bitter influence lay everywhere, he wrote, even in the blue-eyed white Jesus hanging over your bed. The experience of black high school students 
in my own town of Medford in, the, in 2020, just three years ago, reinforced Blow's account. During a protest against punishments handed out to African American students, partially organized by the NAACP, one female student explained, quote, I am not going to lie. Going to high school made me hate being black. Despite 60 years of dedicated modern scholarship, the longest heroic civil rights movement, and endless social and political commentary in too many ways, and too many painful ways, little has changed. Just in the last few years, in classrooms in Vermont, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, Tennessee, Mississippi, and of course, Florida, black students have been compelled to stand in front of their white classmates as slaves to be auctioned off to the highest bidder. Such, quote, curricular violence, as one outraged black Vermont parent said, is hardly unique. In Watertown, New York, the teacher of a fourth grade class ordered black boy, uh, a black boy and girl to stand in front of their white classmates with their hands behind their backs, just as, quote, enslaved times. And the winning bidder would be their master. They tried to escape, the teacher said, they would be chased down and violence would be done for them. An investigation of the incident revealed that the students suffered, quote, lasting emotional harm, no doubt. When a similar event took place in an Ohio fifth grade class, one mother objected, but her complaints were dismissed. She was told that this was just part of the regular state curriculum. Minnesota fifth graders in a lesson plan right out of the 1920s learned that African Americans regretted the end of slavery because, quote, the enslavers took care of them and gave them food and clothing. In Rhode Island, students received absolutely no exposure to the history of slavery until high school, and even then, it, was, it amounted to one paragraph. In Oregon, a teacher advised a group of biracial students who had acted up at lunchtime that, quote, you're lucky I'm not making you pick cotton to clean my house. A Texas teacher advised students that in the South, that the, if the South had won the Civil War, all the black students in class would be slaves. Until 2019, Texas textbooks described slaves as imported workers. It gets worse. And, then, and that secession, not slavery, had caused the Civil War. More recently, in Texas and Florida, the new uh, the, the, the center, the new center of repression and censorship, had banned over 800 books related to slavery, race, sexuality, abortion, and as you know, a host of related issues, including work by my former employer, Henry Lewis Gates Jr. In 2020, the New York Times reported that medical students and residents at a Duke University survey remain convinced that African Americans have thicker skin and less sensitive nerve endings the same vile garbage that Harvard's biologist and ethnologist Louis Agassiz used in the United States in the 19th century. Shockingly, Amy Wax, a law school professor at the University of Pennsylvania, just recently declared that, quote, on average, blacks have lower cognitive ability than whites. And she advised a black law school student that the only reason she was in Ivy League schools was because, quote, of affirmative action, unquote. And if such people continue in American education, that statement will be distressingly true. Despite the monumental outburst of thoughtful and determined scholarship since the mid-1960s, the way we teach history in the public schools remains as lifeless as John Brown's body. We see the results everywhere, from the political domination of the great white demagogue to the murder of 10 Buffalo, New York African Americans by a 19-year-old who the Boston Globe observed was obsessed with, quote, preserving white power in the US. Clearly, 
Slave, slavery and race isn't in the past, it's in the headlines. However taught in school, nevertheless, history is far from a dead thing. We carry it with us, James Baldwin memorably remarked in his essay, The White Man's Guilt. We are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, he said. And history, history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history we owe our frame of reference, our identity, and our aspiration. Thank you. Next up is Caleb Gale, a professor and senior fellow at the Byrne Center for Social Change at Northeastern University. His book, We Refuse to Forget, is considered a, quote, landmark work of untold American history, a provocative narrative of Black Creek stories that, combined with Gale's personal reflections, illuminates how white supremacy has pitted marginalized populations in America against one another. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to try that again. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting to be in a church, especially as a son of uh, pastors, grandson of pastors, especially black pastors. So I'm used to when I say good morning uh, in a church that is a bit of an exuberance that's returned in both good morning and back. So I'm going to try again. There's no need to you know, get up in the aisles to clap and shout or anything like that unless you feel so moved. But we're going to try it again. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we're going to talk about literature um, and race and dismantling institutions. And for that, we deserve, that deserves a certain level of exuberance. And even in listening to Donald talk, it felt as if he was reading portions of even my upbringing, where I grew up in Oklahoma, where likewise I did not know any of those things, where I was taught very much so to hate the skin, the hue of my skin color, and I was taught that the, the nature of my skin color was, was wrong, that Christopher Columbus was a missionary, that um, he was there to do salvific work. Um, strange though it may seem, um, it, it is not history only, it's headlines, very much so. So perhaps it might be helpful if I just read a very short portion of my book that might give you an introduction as to who I am and this strange world of the West. But before I do, I have a question for you all, which is when you think of the West, this is rhetorical, it's for you to think, unless you, again, feel so moved to answer it. <laughs> but when you think of the Western United States, I, I'm curious if you see multiple colors or if you see sepia tone, um, gray and almost muted brown. I'm curious if you see the richness of indigeneity and blackness in it, if you see the beauty of uh, cultures of various sorts that have crafted it, or instead, if you see oftentimes what we've been coached to see, um, which is the most imminent expression of American imperialism and colonialism, right? That's the West, and I would also submit as I read that perhaps we don't know near as much about the America that we had and the construction and invention of American identity until we interrogate that which was um, and forever will be in Indian territory as we now know in Oklahoma. So quickly, let's just read. So I'm going to start with a very indelicate um, uh, phrase, which is the first chapter of the book, and it's called I Got Indian in Me. And Dr. Ty Miles once read, it seemed that to capture the multiplicity and contradictory nature of this past, I would have to tell at least two stories, sketch two histories, enter two worlds, and list two purposes, and sound two calls for justice at once. My Jamaican family moved from New York City to Tulsa, Oklahoma in the late 1990s with few expectations of running into another black person. And in a place that at the time was far less black than the New York we had left, we were desperate to find people whose skin resembled ours and institutions that could make us feel at home. Soon after moving, my parents found a black church in North Tulsa, the part of the city where most of the black people live and the place where 70 years earlier, Black Wall Street once stood tall and sprawled wide. And when I was a kid there, most of the black folks 
especially those who had some history in this buckle of the Bible Belt were known to say a peculiar, indelicate phrase that now sounds so familiar, I got Indian in it. Their ancestors likely included people who had called one of the five nations home. I, I didn't know it then, but the five nations were actually called the five civilized tribes, and even more indelicate way of designating the Cherokee, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek and Seminole nations in Oklahoma since at least 1866. But the kids who say that likely did not know this history, and neither did I, as Donald would indicate that was quite intentional, hint, hint. Um, they passed as uh, simply black, at least I thought they did. And as a child, I thought that black people in America came from only a few places from Africa and recently from a Caribbean country like my parents, also recently or by way of slave ships from the African continent hundreds of years ago, I assumed kids who said I got Indian in me were spreading myths or trying to explain why their skin was somewhat lighter and their hair a bit curlier than mine. But I dismissed these ideas too early. Those kids didn't know the historical power they wielded in that phrase because what they were saying was a simple sentence born of a strange and intentionally forgotten history. One hard to imagine in the bright bustle of the turn of the millennium in America. Even in the second decade of the 21st century, as Oklahoma fights over land, as courthouses hear challenges over identity and as Congress is called even now to admit a new Cherokee representative is hard to grasp, but I trust you, trust me, it is true. What my young friends didn't know when they boasted about their DNA was that their native and black ancestors walked hundreds of miles together from the southeastern United States to reach what became known as Oklahoma. Nor did they know that some of these black ancestors came as slaves, others as adopted citizens, and still others as fully recognized members of the Creek Nation. And I'm willing to bet that none of them ever heard the name of a black man a former putative slave who walked the trail of tears, a man dubbed Cow Tom by his former owner, a Cree chief. Like countless Native Americans, Cow Tom made that long, dangerous trek before he ultimately rose to leadership within the Creek Nation. And in fact, it was Cow Tom who kept my friend's Creek identity intact when he negotiated the 1866 treaty with the U.S. government, an agreement that included citizenship rights for all black people within the Creek Nation, whether slave, adopted, or free. And it may seem odd that a son of Jamaican parents would find his way inside American history, especially inside the history of black people, about whom you've likely never heard in a state you've likely never visited. Most of you should not be well done. I love it in the rearview mirror, but I, I recommend you not go. <laughs> like all history, though, how it started wasn't how it was expected to end, because one day in 2018, I was sitting in the New York office of the British newspaper, The Guardian, I'd worked there as a writer for four or five months, and on this day I was jostling between empty rooms and unoccupied desks while more senior writers and editors went to meetings and to lunches and vacations. I had a story on the books, and my editor and I had a meeting soon to figure out what exactly I'd write next, and I sat at my computer, typed www.tulsaworld.com into my web browser, not because I was looking for inspiration, but because I wanted to a reminder that people could cover news and write stories about places and people most of the world didn't care about. That line didn't go over well at the book events in Tulsa. <laughs> but but it's still, it, it, they still, they got me. It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> but what came up across the top of the Tulsa World's homepage were familiar faces in a story that claimed that black people in the accompanying picture had been members of a nation that wasn't the United States and had freedom that their ancestors had given them in the Creek Nation, but not the United States. And immediately I was intrigued and called some friends I grew up with, many of whom had told me when we were kids that they were part Indian. I knew I had a story, but I didn't realize that the piece I'd eventually write for the Guardian was leading me on a journey that reconfigured my notions of identity, race, and belonging, of institution, and of America. Looking back, it is odd that I wrote a story about Oklahoma, a place I wanted to forget the state whose mere mention often prompted any friend from anywhere else to ask. Where is Oklahoma again? That's another line that did not go over well <laughs> in the events in Oklahoma. In telling you about the place that became home, I can tell you about America and how America fashions its identity. And if this history has shown me anything, it's that there is nothing simple about who you are or where you come from. And like the people on the front page of the Tulsa world, descendants of Cow Tom himself, and other former black citizens of the Creek Nation who had been expelled in 1979, 
We are all beautifully complex, and there's nothing more American than struggling to fit all that complexity into boxes that you did not create in the first place. So I tell you that story as an introduction just to me, in part because we only have 10 minutes, and I don't want to delay it before you for long. There were famous last words of every black teacher in history before you then <laughs> end up still in your seats an hour later. But all I wanted to say is that perhaps the consideration of how America created the West might indicate a better idea as to how this country has fashioned identity overall. And why exactly it is that even now, um, not just in places like Florida, which has garnered such significant attention over its ban of books, its, its direct attacks on inclusivity, but also in places like Oklahoma and in Kansas, or in places like Oklahoma where there are 50 black towns that sprawl wide, that now there are only 13 left, and why exactly that might be intentional, or how even places like Boston were so critical in inventing the West through its efforts through the Immigration Aid Society, that in fact, not just in this book, but in works around uh, the world of literature, especially about this time period, uh, we can actually better trace exactly how we got to where we are now by interrogating the way in which America very intentionally crafted the West, its imagination, its mythic, its every man, every woman in essence. And perhaps if we deconstruct that, we might better understand exactly why it is that America treats its disinherited the way it does. And so from there, I'll just stop. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will hear from Margaret A. Burnham, a professor of law and founding director of the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Practice at Northeastern University, an internationally recognized expert on civil and human rights. Professor Burnham's recent book, By Hands Now Known, has been hailed as a, quote, paradigm-shifting investigation of Jim Crow era violence and the legal establishment that, su that sustained it. And just recently, last week, um, by hands now known, won the LA Times Book Award in History. We've done the good morning, but good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it is a deep pleasure to be here with, uh, uh, on this uh, lovely morning in uh, Newburyport, the beautiful city of Newburyport, with uh, Caleb and with Donald for a stimulating conversation about institutional racism. Uh, I'll say a few words about my book and then I, I will uh, read uh, just a, a paragraph or two and uh, looking forward to a, a very rich and robust discussion here. Uh, so this book is also about the need for a, a, an alternative for, for white people, uh, that to be white requires an alternative. And uh, Caleb has described um, the multiplicity of, of race, that, it, that, that it's not just white and black, but it's also indigenous, and, and the indigenous and black people have their own relationship, which is not based on this white alterity. Uh, and Donald has described the ways um, and the persistence uh, and, uh, and, and, and stubbornness of this view um, that um, the point of departure for all things cultural, political, legal, economic is white, uh, educational is white. Uh, so uh, we've been to the West uh, and we've uh, been to the North and to the textbooks at the Gutman Library. Uh, my book is really about the South uh, and it's about violence, uh, not lynching, uh, but rather the more humdrum, ordinary, uh, per per pervasive uh, violence that uh, defined black-white relations in the South during the Jim Crow period. So I look at a very specific period of time, 20th century, the mid-decades of the 20th century, uh, and I look at the ways in which violence structured the lives and the relationships of whites and blacks who were neighbors, who lived one next door to each other, uh, but for whom the, uh, the, the uh, overriding, overwhelming uh, presence uh, was, uh, or, or, or the overwhelming uh, 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 motif, I should say, or uh, 
uh, was white supremacy. Uh, and so uh, here, um, I, I, and, and this, I came to this project with my students. I teach law at Northeastern University, and uh, as, as, as Caleb, a colleague here. Uh, and I came to this project because the federal government was investigating uh, the crimes of the civil rights era. Uh, and we usually date the civil rights era from 1954 forward, from Brown and Board of Education forward, and we date the Jim Crow era, 1954 back. Uh, and so I started looking at those cases, the cases that were identified by uh, our FBI and our Justice Department, and I realized that there were these earlier, uh, there was this earlier period that was devoid, utterly devoid, of any rule of law in the South. And that those cases had not yet been excavated, they had not yet been unearthed, uh, studied, or written about. And so that's what the book is about. So my students and I started combing through newspapers first, uh, and mostly it was the black press. And we would pull up an article about uh, a man, you know, killed, uh, walking on the wrong side of the sidewalk, or failed to tip his hat uh, for a white person, or some other atrocity that seemed to us as we sat in our law school classroom utterly impossible. This is not our country. Uh, and then we would dig deeper, and we got the records from the Justice Department and the FBI, uh, and we would put together what ultimately became a thousand files of cases that looked like the ones I sample in my book. So the book is really about the violence, the nature of the violence, the impact of the violence, the way it contours black life and white life in the South. It's about the response of our authorities, our federal government, our state and local governments, the failure adequately to address this uh, onslaught of atrocity in the South. And most importantly, perhaps, it's about the unique nature of the resistance that took place. You know, African-American life from 1619, as they say, is one of resistance. Uh, but, but each phase, each period, each um, you know, the practice changes over time. And so I look at the ways in which communities solidify themselves against this violence. Uh, I look at resistance at the, you know, the upper, so-called upper levels of official black life, the ministers, the uh, public, the, to the extent that, the, that there were, were any representatives who could talk to the white public officials and there only were white public officials, uh, as well as the undergrounding uh, of uh, resistance that took place on the buses, on the street corners, uh, in the schools, uh, and uh, try to lift up um, that resistance so that it can remind us about not just what life was like then, so it's history for its own sake, but also inspire us to continue to resist today. I open the book with a story of a woman uh, <clears throat> whose uh, name was Ollie Hunter. And the year is 1942. And she's in a very small town in Georgia. And she is uh, of an age, not a young person. She walks into the store and she picks up a can of oil and is told by the store uh, owner or the clerk of the store, a young man, young white man of uh, 23 or 24 years old, to put down the can. And she does. And she turns, maybe she turns on her heels. Maybe she says something untoward. But she walks out of the store on Main Street in this small town. He follows her and he beats her to death with an axe hammer. Now, you would think that story would be reported in a local newspaper, that there would be a prosecution, that there would be a response from the local African-American community. When we found, what we found was one letter written to the NAACP in New York by a gentleman who recounted the story without naming Ali Hunter. And that set us on our search. Ultimately, we found who she was, a death certificate. And we also found out that the young man who had killed her, we think, 
left uh, was immediately uh, uh, recruited uh, into the service. And that's all we know. And in part, I wrote this book because I thought, I'm going to put this out in the world. And someone in that town, Hawkinsville, is going to say, I know who she was. I know he, who he was. And I can tell you the rest of the story. Well, good people, my book has been banned in prisons, but no one from Hawkinsville has yet stepped up to the plate to finish that story. The other, uh, one other uh, story I'd like to share uh, is uh, from Algiers. Algiers is a town uh, on the other side of New Orleans. It's uh, in Orleans, Paris. Uh, it's on the other side of the river, Mississippi River. And, uh, you know, you play in New Orleans, uh, and then all the dirt that has to do with the play that goes on in New Orleans, that gets over, gets crossed over to Algiers. And the year is 1942, and there is a uh, war going on, of course, and there is a base, a Coast Guard base, in uh, Al Algiers. And this is a Wednesday evening. And my family, a family of, uh, of at that point, four, husband, wife, and two children, are walking home from the beautiful uh, Baptist church where they had been parishioners for generations. Uh, it's a Wednesday, so I'm assuming it's Bible study. And as uh, they walk home, that was name is Williams, Edwin Williams and his wife Lillian. As they walk home, uh, there are three uh, sailors who are crossing the uh, the Africa uh, of uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, elevated um, walkway. And uh, one of the solo sailors throws beer down on Mrs. Williams, who's holding her infant son. And uh, Edwin complains. And the soldier sailors come down, the three of them, they come down, and they engage him in a battle. And the weapons, the only weapon involved, were their bear bottles. And they stab. Edwin Williams to death. Lillian Williams has her two children. She goes back to her home, and she has the presence of mind the next day to go down to the NAACP office in New Orleans and prepare an affidavit. And we got a hold of that affidavit because we combed the NAACP records for these cases. And I said to my student, let's find this family. By the way, I'm sorry. I should add, our War Department did nothing. That's not entirely true. They shipped these three Coast Guard members out. They fought in Europe. They came back home. And they lived full lives. One of them was tried. The other two testified that there were a gang of black men around who threatened them, and they uh, fought back. Those lives, lives were believed by the jury. That's the end of the case. So my student looked far and wide for a man named Williams in Louisiana, black man named Williams. And ultimately, she finds him. And he is of an age. He's in his 70s. And she calls him and wants to chat with him about the case. And he says, I can't talk to you about this. I cannot talk to you about this. And I tell the student, keep pressing. There's someone who needs to know what we have in our records and who has a, share, a story to share with us. And she reaches down and finds the next generation, those folks who are now the grandchildren of the dead man 
Edwin Williams. And they respond, and on June 10th of 2022, we all gather with the Williams family. Edwin, uh, Lillian Williams had five boys. She had four with Edwin, and then she took in another boy, a neighbor's child. And she raised those five boys, and every single one of those men were at the beautiful Zion Baptist Church, where that family had worshipped since the turn of the 20th century. The church still stands. James Williams, who was in his mother's arms when his father was killed, is now the minister of that church, the pastor of that church. We brought that case full circle, but we can't do it with every case. But it must be done with every case. This history has to be recovered. It has to be restored to the long, bitter, and yet glorious prayer of American history. And as I said, we've got a thousand cases. 30 of them are in my book. But it took us years to get to those 30. And so these folks are still alive. And so I say it has to be restored because we owe it to them. We owe it to them to give them a chance to tell us what this was like for them, how it affected them and their families. Our time is really moving by fast. Thank you so much. It's time to. <laughs> question first and then we'll go to the audience. We just have a few minutes left. But you've all done so, such incredible work with your research and in uncovering all these stories and these histories that many people um, didn't know until you put them together in these ways. And I'm curious what your hopes are for readers who encounter your work in your book. So, so I, I was, I've got the mic, so <laughs> let me go for it. So, you know, I, the, again, the, this work uh, is intended to honor, recognize uh, the, the families uh, who lived through Jim Crow and who uh, experienced the kind of violence that I uh, have uncovered. And it is also for history. So the stories are not just for them, but it's also so that we can better understand, not just where we are today, but history for its own sake, so that we can appreciate what it was like for those who lived through it, right? So uh, those are, that's essentially what I hope to get from readers. And also, I want to communicate, as I hope I have done here today, a sense of urgency here that we can talk about slavery for a long time. We can also talk, and we need to talk about the trail of tears and what it produced. But these folks who lived through Jim Crow are with us today. They are still alive. In 20 years, they may not be. And so if we're going to capture what it is they have to teach us, and if we're going to make their stories ours, we have to do it now. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, what do I have to accomplish with this book? Well, uh, two, I, two things. One, transformation of American identity. That's the point here. And you change our definition of it. Uh, and secondly, how we teach that identity. Uh, a colleague of mine, James Burr Stewart, uh, who is, uh, used to be dean of uh, 
Callister College, uh, is orchestrating a, uh, an event, I hope for the fall, <laughs> hope it is any sooner, uh, that will, we all hope, um, will begin a, what, what uh, I call a curricular revolution uh, in American teaching of, of history. Uh, modest goals, sure, certainly, but uh, uh, if you don't have a big goal in mind, then I think um, you're probably wasting your time more than Good point. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, look, the, as Margaret mentioned, with, with the South, I mean, we, we in America exported the South in some of its worst and most violent ways to the West, right? And so a lot of the folks who can remember the times where they were able to establish for themselves their own towns on their own rules in their own ways can now very much still recall that all being ripped away, all of that dissolving. And so for me, a lot of the point of the book is to add to the historical record their stories before they're gone, right? And I think additionally, like I, this might sound vainglorious, but I think that histories, especially those that have been so shrouded in America's growing disinterest in nuance, deserve beautiful sentences. They deserve their stories rendered with grace and eloquence in a way that, that they don't ever get. And so likewise, in, in Oklahoma, I, my book is not beloved by a governor who's actively trying to root out any sort of influence that black or indigenous or black indigenous communities have. And so I know that my book serves as an agitator to that, and that is definitely the point. So beautiful sentences for those whose existence not only represents resistance then, but also now, and whose resistance is agitating antagonists towards a history that, if told properly and beautifully, could really help us reconceptualize what it means to participate in this enterprise of being an American. Thank you so much. Uh, 
living like that 19-year-old in Buffalo in dead fear that his, his identity, national identity, is, being, is under threat and being changed. Uh, it's, going, it's going to continue, and it, I'm afraid it will get worse. Uh, I am hopeful, however, that events like this and uh, it helps change public opinion. And I've been on the road since September, and I got to tell you, uh, it is it, it is it is so um, comforting to me that there are at least some people uh, who are genuinely interested in this and appreciate the work that that you know, Margaret is doing that we're all doing to help uh, change and transform our understanding of the past to affect the present. say these are all imprecated phenomena. Um, that is, uh, the, well, going back to Caleb's work, um, the dispossession and you know, expropriation of the land of uh, native peoples, of indigenous peoples, colonialism, slavery, these are, these are and modernity. Um, these are these phenomena all have you know their roots in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, and uh, we are we continue to live with the legacies of, of you know of these of, of these uh, phenomena. So and and yes, uh, is it global? Obviously, it's glo global. Uh, our responses uh, need to be particularized. Um, they do need to uh, be fully uh, appreciative of the unique, as, unique aspects of our history uh, and of our politics. Uh, but uh, we also have to understand the ways in which uh, the, the work that we're doing, for example, fits into a global movement to identify tools that help us uh, take account of the past. And this goes back to the last question, apologies. Um, so these tools obviously have, you know, uh, been uh, more fully developed since the TRC in South Africa, uh, and they are global in nature. And but they are small and inadequate uh, next to the work that has to be done. And I will also say, as I say in my book, um, that that developments along these lines, thinking about reparations, uh, redress, all those R words, uh, plus you know, plus apologies and truth and memory. Uh, all you know, all of this work uh, has gone on on the global front with far more rapidity and in a far more robust fashion than it has in the United States. And the U.S. has to catch up, and there's much to learn from what's going on elsewhere in the world on that front. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, okay. Okay. So we'll need to end. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, all of you, um, for your remarks and for your books. Um, the books will be available in the back of the, um, the church as well, and you can meet the um, authors and have your books signed there. Thank you to Mass Center, the book, and for the new Award.